Jonathan Levy, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? I'm fantastic, Chris. Thanks for having me. You're out in Israel, right? Yes, that explains the uh, very sexy blue blocker glasses to all our video viewers. Yeah, I'm in Tel Aviv, so it's uh, evening for me. Right, right. And uh, just so everybody knows, one of the things about blue light, if you're staring at computer screens, and we're going to get into a bunch of this stuff today, so I hope you guys have your mm -hmm. pens and paper ready. But uh, when you I stare do. at blue light later in the day, it can actually trick your brain into thinking it's daytime and keep your brain from producing all the chemicals that are going to help you to get to sleep, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and these are one of six different pairs I have with different varying gradients. Because uh, you also don't want, uh, as Dave Asprey has, has told me, you don't want uh, perfect white light during the day either, junk light, right? Like there's nothing natural about fluorescent lighting. It right. can actually give people headaches. It can cause all kinds of like adrenal fatigue and nasty stuff. Particularly in the winter time, you know, with the, those people who are in the East Coast or maybe up in yep. the Pacific Northwest where it's getting darker earlier and earlier and they're in offices all day long, right? Not even seeing the sun, not, even, not getting any natural light, right? Yeah. And, and that's another thing, right? It's like, not only are we getting unnatural light, we're not getting the natural light. I actually went to a naturopath last week and he prescribed, you're going to love this. He prescribed me to be outside barefooted in the sun for at least 30 minutes a day. This was a prescription from a doctor and, uh, and I did it and I feel amazing. It's like, yeah. you need, you need to, you need grounding first off, like literal, I'm not talking about earthing and spirituality, although we can get into that, but literally your body needs electrical current to be able to escape. And you need that vitamin D big time. Big time, big time. Yeah, I try to do that every single day, get outside. Luckily, I live in California. So yep. in the wintertime, I can get outside, take my shoes off, get some sun, stuff like that. But uh, it's so important. And if you're not getting that vitamin D, I mean, vitamin D is responsible for so many things around your body. Um, yep. You're really selling yourself short. But uh, so big questions, you know, I, I've been a fan of yours. I just had the chance to come on to your show and, and have you coming on here now. Um, number one, you know, uh, how'd you end up in Israel? Well, did you grow up yeah. there? Did you, did you end up moving out there? So my dad is Israeli. So I grew up speaking a little bit of Hebrew here and there. And I spent a lot of summers here and always had fond memories. And I got accepted to an international business school. And I figured I'll go do, uh, it was a condensed program. So I didn't have time for an internship. I figured I'll make my own internship. And I kind of knew going to this international business school, like no one has heard of it in the US. So I kind of realized like, this is a decision that's probably going to lead to other decisions that it's going to lead to me expatriating, uh, which I was okay with. And so I came here for a couple of months. I just fell in love with the city. Uh, really loved Tel Aviv. Felt like I was a happier person and a better version of myself. Uh, I don't know if you're in Northern or Southern California, but either way, you know that in California, we have a tendency to, everyone kind of wants to be something they're not. Right. Uh, I think, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's like every entrepreneur wants to be a VC and every VC wants to be an entrepreneur. And in LA, it's a whole different thing. Yeah. I lived people, in LA for a while. Of, it was, uh, yeah. I, yeah. I was in the fitness industry and every personal trainer wanted to be a, a, an action star or, a or an actor or something right. like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I found that I'm just like a happier version of me here. Uh, and, and it also tempers some of my worst qualities. Like it's really hard to be materialistic when you don't have Amazon prime or Trader Joe's or like everything is twice the price. So you're just like, I'm not going to buy anything here. Uh, it's really easy to live a more minimalist lifestyle. And I like that. Um, and it's really easy to be grateful every day when like this, this country is a miracle living here is a miracle. Uh, and it's super easy to be grateful living here. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I, I really want to get out to Israel. I, I oh, actually, through 23andMe, I just found out I was Jewish. Uh, no way. Yeah, I grew up thinking Mazel I was Jewish. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. I grew up thinking I was Italian and, and, and German. And I do have Italian in me, but, uh, but I'm mostly Ashkenazi Jew. And, uh, 
want really really want to get out there and and, and check it out i've uh yeah, I've been around the mediterranean i've been all over the middle east but but never to israel so um you, you with your story i was i was watching your ted talk uh yesterday and i know you you ended up going to some great school went to berkeley um ended up getting into entrepreneurship early on you sold a business early on mm-hmm. um but you know you mentioned this idea of learning and yeah. you know you, you kind of muscled through muscled into that school through force of will muscled yourself mm-hmm. into this situation where you were able to sell a business early on but you, you kind of did so with a handicap and and uh, one of your premises is that we're all doing so with a handicap because we're not really learning how we should be. How'd you get into this and how'd you figure this out? Yeah, well, I definitely had a handicap and I definitely had crutches. I needed prescription stimulants to get through high school and college. Like there was no way I was sitting in that classroom and getting passing grades if I wasn't drugged out most of the time. And like, you might hear that story and think that I'm against ADD medication, but I think it's a necessary evil for the way that education works. Like we're not meant to sit in classrooms and some of us more than others, but it's really hard on a 16 year old kid to sit in a classroom and have to pay attention for eight hours a day. Um, So I always struggled growing up with learning inside and outside the classroom. It wasn't just in the classroom that I wasn't catching up with students and wasn't able to understand what was happening, but outside the classroom, I wasn't understanding the social skills and the, the, athletic skills and all these other things. And it really kind of culminated for me at 13 where I had nothing to be proud of. I wasn't able to make friends. My grades were terrible. I was contemplating suicide because I was like, I just don't want to be this person anymore. I'm sick of it. And I, I realized that slowly I realized, piece by piece, I realized that I can actually change who I am. And that learning was the way to become a different person, a better person in my case. And it it took a lot of lessons and a lot of trial and error and a lot of muscling through, as you said. And I I got really lucky because when I got accepted to business school, I was here in Israel and I was already really nervous, really anxious because I knew that my old technique of taking a bunch of medication, locking myself in the bedroom door, in the bedroom and uh, locking the door and catching up to everything that every other student had understood in the lecture wasn't going to work because in business school, you have zero free time. You're constantly networking. You're doing case studies at night. You're traveling. You're going to you know events. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do if I don't have the time to just work twice as hard as everyone else. And I met someone who actually, he and his wife had been training problem students in speed reading and memory techniques. And they, I hired them as private tutors. I was like, this is amazing. Mm. And it really whet my appetite and helped me understand that first off, as I'm sure you know, having done this podcast for so long, there are real life superhuman skills that you can learn. Like there are superhumans, there are the Michael Phelpses and the Dean Karnazes and people who can do literally superhuman stuff. But then for every one of those, there's another like Wim Hof or Nelson Dellis who are real life people who have learned how to do superhuman things and will tell you like, yeah, I was actually pretty average before. And so it opened my whole world. And I, I took that skill and kind of doubled down, if you will. So they taught me a, a fair bit about speed reading and memory. And then I took that and figured out what else can I learn about the brain, about memory, about how we learn, about how we remember. I solved a lot of different problems for myself from physical maladies to social maladies to business maladies uh, and I just keep doing it. Like I, f- I feel like now for the last almost decade, every time I have a problem in life, I just treat it as a learning challenge and I learn my way out of it. So I'll give you some examples. Like six years ago, I knew nothing about podcasting, online courses, online marketing, video production, video editing, like none of this stuff. And today we have 4 million downloads in a podcast, 250,000 paid enrollments in our courses. Our courses are some of the highest rated in the industry. Like I knew none of this stuff. I didn't know anything. And I wish I'd had help. Like I had some mentors here and there that I learned from, but for the most part, like I had to learn my way out of it. 
I also went nine years being single. And, and my story that I was telling myself was, I just haven't met the right one. I haven't met the right one. And then, and, and I even remember telling my friends, like, this is so frustrating because everything else in life, the more effort I put in, the more results I get. But it seems like with this, the more effort I put in, the more I seem desperate and the worse results I get. But then I changed my mindset and I said, what if this isn't a, an opportunity and a chance problem? What if this is a learning problem? What if I just don't know what I need to know to be in a healthy and happy relationship? And so I changed my mindset and I started learning, like, what does it take to be in a healthy relationship? What is a healthy relationship? Like, how does that get defined and, and how do I know? And I, I did all these things that, I, that we do that we teach in our courses to learn. And within three months, I met my wife, who I'm now happily married to. <laughs> uh, and, and it really kind of, it convinced me that any problem that you have, asterisk, you know, if you're terminally ill, learning will probably not. Although we did have a student whose mother was terminally ill and he applied these skills and he managed to get ahead of his, the, the primary care physician for his mother and read all the clinical research. He managed to get her into a clinical trial that the doctor didn't even know about. Her, her cancer was still terminal, unfortunately, but it, he managed to significantly improve her end of life care because of this clinical trial. So um, there are some problems I'm sure learning can fix, but for the vast majority of our problems, emotional, economic, social, intellectual, academic, you can solve them through learning. That's, uh, that's amazing because, you know, with our audience here, so most of the audience we, we're talking to here, combat veterans, US, US Army, US Marine Corps. And uh, yeah. I talk to a lot of guys every single day and a lot of them feel like they're trapped and they're trapped by their own intellectual ability. A lot of them feel that they don't have the intellectual ability to do other things in their lives after their time in the military. And a lot of times people feel like they're stuck. Um, and it goes back to the same old story we're taught where if you don't meet those certain requirements when you're in school, you're not a good student. You're not right. you're keeping up with the other kids. You're not um, able to to get that GPA by the end of your high school career. Not able to get into college. Then you're stuck in a certain path in life. Um, but we're in this kind of different time and place now, where I think you know, in a lot of ways, things like podcasts and and the internet, they're they're similar in revolutionary scale to the the Gutenberg press. Right, where yep. we have all this ability to take in new types of information. And I think totally. people can make so many changes if they, they learn that skill a little bit better, or change their mindset a, a little bit about that yes. skill. Right? And the human brain is the most adaptable organ known. I mean, on the human body for sure. I'm not sure. There's probably some more adaptable, you know, newts in, in the creeks or whatever. But the human brain will adapt to whatever you throw at it. And we, we know, first off, there's a huge misconception that we lose neuroplasticity as we age. We do not. You can decide tomorrow to become a London taxi driver and study for, they call it the knowledge, where you need to know every single street and every corner and every everything. And your brain will actually change. You can, heaven forbid, of course, undergo a traumatic brain injury, have to have a piece of your brain removed, and the rest of your brain will change how it works. There are tons of, of studies on people who have had you know, projectiles in their brains. They have to lose a piece of the brain. And suddenly after a few months, that function that's supposed to be gone comes back. So the brain is wildly plastic. You can teach it new tricks. And studies have actually shown the techniques that we teach, things like the memory palace and how to create visual mnemonics and how to use your visual memory, they actually rewire the brain and the way that it works. So if you study the brain of a world memory expert, someone who could memorize pi to 10,000 digits, for example, and you study the brain of an average person, same foundational hardware, some parts are slightly enlarged or, or decreased, but no more than say someone who meditates every day for a year, right? Like we know meditation changes the brain, changes the prefrontal cortex, cortical gyrification, all this cool, crazy stuff that we all want 
You know, we all want our brains to not be reactive and be happy all the time and be producing uh, happy hormones. But that's actually not what's happening. That's not what is making that person able to do that incredible feat. It's literally, they use their brain totally different than you, you and I, or th than most people, I should say. Uh, mm -hmm. I use my brain this way now. <laughs> I've learned to. Uh, their brain's lighting up in different ways. It's wired up in different ways. And they're using different parts of the brain than other people when they're memorizing information. And I, I hate to like just go on a podcast and, and tease information. So I want to share what it is that they're doing. Uh, how many times have you heard people say, gosh, I wish I had a photographic memory? Tons, tons. All the time. Well, good news, you do. We all do. It comes standard. <laughs> it's not even an upgrade. It comes standard. It's like one of those features that you never knew you had in your car until one day you press a button. You're like, oh my God, there's, there's a glove box here. I didn't know that. Uh, we all have a visual memory. In fact, research has shown that memory is inextricably linked to visual stimulation, which is why I challenge you if you're listening to this podcast, you're driving around the city or whatever, this idea that I'm sharing right now around visual memory will be anchored to wherever you are. And five years down the line, if you drive down that same street, hit this same corner, you're going to go, oh, this is the place where I learned about visual memory. You can't help it. It's how your brain works. It's part of the survival architecture of the human brain. And by the way, all mammalian brains. So you have a visual memory and what we teach and what these world memory champions do is rediscovering how to use that visual memory in very novel ways uh, that have been around for 2,500 years. So how do I create visualizations for the first 10,000 digits of pi? And then how do I store them in my brain in a way that I can remember? That's awesome. And, you know, one thing I want to mention here, because you know, you, you kind of got onto this path because you went out there and you, you took some chances in life, right? So trying to get into those schools. Also entrepreneurship, huge chance. I mean, you, you, you eat what you kill. And if yeah. you're not able to kill, you're not able to learn how to kill, then you're not going to be able to, to make any money and, and things are going to fail, right? One of the yeah. things that, you know, a lot of our listeners being men, is a lot of men get older, they tend to take less chances. They don't have that risk-taking factor in their lives anymore. They settle down into home. They try, yep. they live a lot more quietly, don't try new things. But part of yep. this is about going out there and actually seeking new challenges and, and trying new things, right? Totally. Yes. And there is, a, there is definitely a neurological uh, neuroscience component to that because I see that in myself. I think back and I was like, when I was an 18-year-old kid, I was like, yeah, I'll just start a company and I'll put this much money here and I'll do that. And, and it, it, there is an element of like your prefrontal cortex thins as you age. So like you ever see a 15-year-old kid skateboarding without a helmet? And you're like, oh, how stupid. Like, what does he think? He's yes, he actually thinks he's invincible because our, our our perception of risk changes as we age. And we've seen a hundred different ways that things can go wrong. But at the same time, I think you need to, within your risk appetite in life, you need to engineer in calculated risk. So I think a lot of people look at entrepreneurs and they say, oh, I can never do that. I'm not a risk taker. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. I don't take a lot of risk when I start my businesses. I, no. I've started two businesses that have exceeded $2 million in sales. I've never put more than $2,500 on the line. And of course, my time. But I've, I've never like put 50K down to start a business. It's always been like, oh, I could scrape together, you know, two grand here and start this. This business I started with a couple hundred bucks, you know, and so it's, it's very calculated risks. And it's also, you know, you don't burn the ships. Uh, although I think in life, I saw you did a podcast episode about burning the ships. I think there is a ton of value in certain situations to burning the ships, mm -hmm. but no one's telling you to burn the ships when you have two kids and a wife and, and you know, you have a side project you want to try. It's like you burn the ships when you can see land, not in the middle of the Atlantic. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think here's the problem. I think we need systems. We need accountability. We need to be accountable to ourselves and others because otherwise these dreams are just dreams. They just live in the drawer. Right. And there's a saying in Hebrew, like better a public failure than a dream in a drawer. And, and I think that's true. So I think we need one to be accountable to ourselves, right? Like if you have that dream of, of being an entrepreneur or changing industry, put a big fat timeline on it. 
Like I'm mm-hmm. going to do that by 2025. By 2025, I'm going to be self-employed. I don't know how. And then be accountable. Tell it to your wife. Tell it to your kids. Tell it to your friends. That's when it becomes real. That's where the rubber hits the road. Right. Because then everybody knows you're doing it. And if you don't right. do it, then, then you're a liar, right? And uh, nobody wants Guilt to Guilt is a really powerful motivator. I mean, you know, you're, you're part Ashkenazi Jewish. so <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said, you know, because a lot of these guys, as they're getting out, they're just, you know, they did their four years and they're 22, yep. right? So they're, they're yep. heading out into the world. And before you're going to head into that job, so to speak, or you're going to settle into this kind of routine life. I mean, there's something to be said for, for taking a chance and going out and traveling, moving to Israel or, or, yep. you know, trying to start a business. Cause you know, when you're 22, you can still live on your friend's couch. You can still, you know, do that kind of stuff. It, it, it's a lot easier to do that when you're 22 than when you're, you know, my age 40. Sure. So, so there's, there's a time to try that stuff. Um, you also do a lot of like acro yoga, martial arts, things like that. And that's a big learning component too, because a lot of times if you learn something that makes you better at learning other things, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I do want to add one thing on the, on the 22 thing really quickly, but I'll, I'll file a mental marker here to come back. Um, I heard a really cool exercise the other day. I'm really big on goal setting. We're recording this on December 30th. I already have all my goals lined up for 2020. And, uh, and someone shared with me a really nice idea, which was, I think it originally comes from Ben Hardy, which was just think about yourself 10 years ago and just think like how much change a person can do in 10 years. Like 10 years ago, I was just graduating college and I was running a totally different business and I was living in a totally different country and all these different things. And for a lot of these guys in the audience, 10 years ago, you were 12 years old. Now we have a tendency to go, okay, well, it's different because 10 years when you're 12 to 22 is different from 22 to 32. And I would argue, no, it's not. Neurologically, it doesn't have to be. In terms of your life choices, that's up to you, right? The difference between 22 and 32, you could be a father of two kids. You could be a business owner. Those are arguably bigger changes than 12 to 22. And I think that continues, right? So like, let's say 52 to 62, your whole life could change. You could become a retiree. You could be volunteering. You could sell off your business. You could move to Aruba. Like you can create these quantum leaps every 10 years. It's just a mindset thing. And I think too many people do what I call the the prefix life, right? Like the fixed menu of like, this is what you do at this age. As opposed to being like, I had a friend the other day tell me who's my age, 33. He goes, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna get married for another five years. And part of me was like, ouch. But the other part of me was like, good for you. Like you have a goal, you're building your business, you're doing whatever you want to do. You're not falling into the pressure. And so I think the same is true of, of, of someone just now finishing who is like, Oh, I should just go get a job. Like take the year to travel, like go the a la carte route. Right. Yeah. So. So important. So important. And I think, uh, don't be in a rush to get old. That's, that's the big thing. Oh my gosh. Yes. Or just never do. My dad's uh, 73 years old and he's more of a child than me in terms of like childlike spirit. Let me tell you. Uh, So coming back to your question, uh, all learning has value, I believe, not just because it's good to know more stuff, but you'd be amazed like how the pieces connect. So a, a good example for me was I So I remember I said, when I first learned how to speed read, I fixed a bunch of physical maladies that I had. So I had some pretty bad joint pain in my uh, knees and my shoulders are unstable from birth. And I I had just taken these as like fixed problems. But, you know, when I, when I discovered this, I was like, I wonder if those are actually fixed problems or just in my head. So I read a bunch of books on kinesiology, on biokinetics, on uh, mobility, muscle maintenance, really dug deep into it and basically learned like how to use my body properly. And it turns out I wasn't using my knees or my shoulders properly. 
uh, wasn't using my spine properly. Most people don't use their spine properly or their abs properly. Although guys grad finishing in the military probably actually know how to use their spine and their torso and hold their bodies correctly. But in any case, uh, so I fixed that problem. And I thought that's really cool knowledge and really valuable. I never thought that all that information about the ways that muscles and joints move and all the different pieces and the proper movement patterns and how to hold my body would help me in Olympic weightlifting. But they did. Then they helped me in acro yoga. And then I did, I've only done one golf lesson in my life. Uh, a girlfriend at the time for my birthday bought me like a, a full day tutorial. And I go out there and I'm like, I'm asking really silly questions that I'm sure the instructor had never asked. Like, okay, so just so I understand the, the force is coming from centrifugal in the hip at this point. And he's like, I, I mean, I never thought about it that way, but yeah, it's centrifugal force driven from the hip. I'm like, okay, and, and am I like extending my patella out this way to drive that force? And, and lo and behold, at first swing, I get like five meters away from the hole, 300 yards. The guy's like, I've never in my life seen anyone do that. And, and he actually, he asked my girlfriend, he's like, this is, you're playing a joke on me, right? Like he plays golf. I'm like, no, I just, I, I saw how you moved your body. I asked questions to verify because I can't feel what you're feeling. And then I just did what you did. The guy was like, that's ridiculous. Now, the, the remainder of the shots weren't all quite as good. But exactly as you said, like, you never know when this knowledge is going to come up. You mentioned uh, Gutenberg's printing press. Like, I had filed away a bunch of knowledge there around that because I found it interesting in the same way you do. And when I was writing my most recent book, The Only Skill That Matters, it's like, oh my God, this is a perfect metaphor for what's happening with the explosion of knowledge and how the evolution of human consciousness has changed. And so I was just able to boop, 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 you know? So you That's never awesome. know. And, and, and on top of all of that, learning is, is like a muscle, right? Like, and, and not so much because learning one thing is different from learning another thing. It's not so much that like learning trigonometry is going to make it easier to learn Russian, but what it's going to do is give you the confidence. So I used to be a really lousy learner. And today I can dive into something like uh, I've learned all at, at a intermediate level. I'm not a virtuoso at any of these, but piano, guitar, I speak four languages. And you can't do that unless you have that confidence to go in and be like, oh, Russian's one of the hardest languages on the planet to learn. All right, let's go. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, if you go around believing that you're a, a, an inferior learner, you just won't do it. Right. And, you know, one of the things too, I think is that there's, there's so many choices as to what to learn. Right. Yeah. And, and some of those things in this day and age, I mean, there's some things you can learn that'll, that'll pay so many dividends, but there's also some things that if you focus too much on them, they'll take you down some, some dark places, some, some roads that video you might games, for example. Down. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, I, I I, uh, you'd mentioned, I think, uh, I was listening to a podcast you were doing, you mentioned quantum physics or quantum mechanics, and mm -hmm. you were going down that road. And, and I had, um, I had a quantum mechanics guy on here and, um, we were, we were talking and, and he's talking about alternate dimensions, alternative realities, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, great, but I don't know if I really want to sit here and think about all those possibilities. Yeah. Right. I had the same experience. I, I, after a, a couple really intense psychedelic journeys. Uh, I, I, I maybe flew a little too close to the light and saw things that I wasn't ready to see in terms of the nature of our reality. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll read about quantum physics and I'll learn about quantum mechanics and that'll help me understand what I was seeing and what I was feeling. And, and it totally didn't, <laughs> it just, all it did was like, yep, what you saw, like all these alternate realities and experiences and like, the, the problem of reality being like paper thin, like that's all real. <laughs> and some of the smartest people on the planet agree. So like, there's no easy way out of these big, scary questions. And I was like, okay, that's enough quantum mechanics for me. It's terrifying. Yeah. It's yeah, so no, hard to maintain your grasp. It definitely, it definitely gets crazy. And um, you'd mentioned psychedelics. We've talked a bit about psychedelics here. We've had a, a, a couple of people on here who, uh, who take people on ayahuasca journeys. I've done, I've done a DMT journey myself. Um, mm -hmm. do, do those have a place here? Um, in, in maybe if not psychedelics, I, I mean, other 
other chemicals that might help the brain or, or change the brain, like cool. neurotropics and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So psychedelics are a really interesting thing, um, I think, for trauma. And especially in, in your community, like there is so much amazing and interesting work that I'm sure you've talked about for PTSD. A lot of it actually happening in Israel. If people haven't seen A Trip of Compassion, amazing, amazing movie about how Israel's dealing with PTSD using MDMA. Uh, as far as the brain and learning are concerned and, and substances, man, it's like, it's almost like art. You know, you have this palette of all these different colors that you can use. And if you just want to sit still and focus on one rote task, you have amphetamines and, and even less kind of serious uh, substances uh, like Ritalin all the way to like, if you need creativity, microdosing, LSD to, uh, uh, I always forget the name of this, paracetam and everything mm -hmm. in between. You have natural, not natural you have stimulants, you have depressants. So it's, it's this crazy wide world. Uh, I like to call it like uh, designing your, your state of mind in the same way that like, you know, if, if you want to have a spiritual experience, you can design a state of mind. Uh, what I would advocate for everyone in the audience though is a safe experimentation uh, protocol, which is mm -hmm. one, Talk to your doctor. I know you think you can't tell your doctor. Like It's kind of like a marriage, if you will. I know you think you can't communicate openly about this, but you can. And you can go to your, your GP and be like, hey, I know you're going to try and talk me out of it, but I'm considering doing LSD. I'd like to get some blood work done to make sure I'm healthy enough. Um, so that's, that's an important thing. Set and setting, really, really important for any of these drugs. Mm -hmm. Even caffeine is a drug with side effects like Ensure that you're in the right state of mind to do these drugs and then do your homework. You know, there, right. there are so many substances and compounds out there. The FDA does not regulate uh, supplements. It, it very loosely regulates, let's put it that way. And so you got to be careful. The brain is a really sensitive instrument. It will recover for most things that you give it. But it's also the, I mean, you know this probably from your DMT experiences, the human brain is the most potent instrument for torture you yeah. can imagine. And so if, if, you know, if, if you're experimenting with yerba mate as opposed to coffee, great. That's awesome. That's safe. That's time tested. If you're experimenting with paracetam or aniracetam, these substances that have been around for 50, 60 years, or even Ritalin, Adderall, these have been around, they've been, they've been researched. If you're uh, trying that hot new, you know, licking the toad for getting more productivity, yeah. less proven, you know, less yeah. proven. So, so be safe uh, out there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There, there, there's a load of stuff. Um, you can always dabble, but remember that if you take too much of something, you can't take less of it. All right. So right. And you can find yourself in a hole. Um, yeah. So you built this, this, cool empire um and it, it, it all started with udemy right you, you started putting courses out there on udemy and uh you know it, i've been watching a bit of your journey there and, and you've got uh, really unique marketing you've got really unique uh you. way of going about things um when did it first come in your mind that you were going to put a course out there on something like this it's really funny that you ask. So I, I hired these two people as, as private tutors. I went to business school, was completely empowered by this whole methodology and wanted to learn more. I then went about to do a startup uh, and in the process of doing that, decided I should learn more about coding. So I figured, how am I going to learn how to code? Googled around online, found a company called One Month. At the time, they only had one course. It was $50. And I took this course, learned a little bit about how to program, enough to be able to understand what my partner was building. And I thought to myself, like, this is really cool. It's like me, and I could see in the comments that there were thousands of other people taking the course with me. Mm -hmm. And it's like me and thousands of other people pay $50. These two guys sitting in an apartment in New York City record it once. And we all can get value out of it. And they're making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. 
they've since become really good friends of mine, Matan Griffel and Chris Castiglione. And, uh, and I thought that's a really cool idea. I kind of filed it away. The startup idea didn't work. Decided to move to Israel, leave Silicon Valley, leave the idea behind. And along about then I thought, you know, I needed some runway. I'd sold my previous business. I had some income coming in from here and there and investments. But I figured if I just had another thousand dollars a month, I could, if it takes me 10 years to find my next big entrepreneurial idea, that's fine. Like what I wanted to do was buy myself infinite runway so that I would not have to make a decision based on money. And, uh, and you know, I was living really cheaply. I had a roommate and not living like someone who just sold an Inc. 5000 uh, company. So I was, I was living frugally and figured however long it takes, it takes. So I built this course uh, and I, I discovered Udemy because Matan Griffel had mentioned in his Rails course, he's like, in, in his credentials, like we have one of the top selling courses on Udemy as well. Didn't know about Udemy, but I put a course up on there and I knew nothing again about marketing or, or any aspect of this, but it took me about a month to learn and build the course, the first version, put it online. And in the first four days, we made 500 bucks. And I thought, that's amazing. So I took myself on vacation with some friends where I didn't have internet. And I checked at the end of the month and we'd made $2,200. I was like, nice, that's great. And then the next month it was five. And then the next month it was eight. And then everything just went crazy. Uh, and it took me 14 months to decide maybe I should build another course. I have other things that I'd like to talk about. And then it took me probably another eight to 10 months after that to decide that I would actually do this full time and stop all the different other stuff that I was doing. Uh, and start doing a podcast and book. So I like reluctantly kind of got pulled into it by ultimately realizing I, I have this tool that I teach in one of our courses called the career criteria list. So mm -hmm. like my, my idea is my thought and experience is that if I tell you like, what's your perfect dream job, Chris, it's asking you like design a house. Like you're not an architect. You're, but but what you can tell me, you can't draw the whole house out for me. But if I ask you pointed questions, like, Chris, do you want modern architecture or rustic architecture? You can tell me. Do you like light colors or dark colors? It's really easy to come up with it in the way that they do, you know, those sketches at the, the police uh, academy of like, what did the... Hello. So I have people go through this exercise of like must have and must not have in their dream career, right? So like must have the opportunity to do public speaking, must not have to manage people, must be location independent, must not require uh, whatever. And at the end, you end up with a rough image. And I, I kind of like, you know, the saying goes like uh, the shoemaker goes barefoot. So I've used this technique. And then eventually I realized like I have this criteria list and what I'm doing part time in this business actually matches pretty much all of it. Uh, so I, I doubled down on it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And you know, when, when you're doing something like that, so, you know, you start with you to me, you're putting the course out there and then, and then you figure out that the podcast will probably be the best way of getting information out there in long form. Right. And then, from there, it just kind of branches off and you get into YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I think uh, I, had, I had mentorship a lot. Uh, Anthony Metivier was a couple years ahead of me and he's also in the memory space. And he invited me onto his podcast and I thought, wow, that was a lot of fun. I, I should do one of those as well. Uh, he told me about his books and his premium level courses and I was like, gee, I should do those as well. So, um, I definitely had a lot of mentorship and continue, by the way, to have a lot of mentorship. I missed a lot in going to different groups and masterminds and things like that uh, to learn from what other people are doing. So important. So important. You got it. You got to go out there. You're not going to have all the, all the answers in your head. No. You got to go out there and you got to find people who are going to help you along on the way. Well, and that's don't awesome. be shy. Like, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to be like, I don't know. I don't know the answers.
Exactly. And actually, that's one of the big reasons why I run a podcast in the first place is because I get to talk to great people like you. And I'm sure you do yourself. You get to talk to so many amazing people, teach you so many things, right? Big time. I'm actually thinking about doing another podcast around like basically entrepreneurial life balance and how other entrepreneurs are using the free time that they create. Cause I'm a strategic coach with Dan Sullivan and the whole thing is about creating entrepreneurial freedom. Like it's about freeing up my time, freeing up my money, freeing up who I get to work with. And my big question that's really surprisingly hard for me is like, how do I use that freedom? Right? So I'm taking a free day tomorrow, Tuesday, middle of the week, like, what do I do with myself? And I want ideas because I don't have the answers. Like, what are other people doing? What are, what are the hobbies they've taken up? What, where are they volunteering? Like, how are they using that time that they've created for themselves? Because if you're not using it, if you're using it for Netflix, it's like, what's the point? I might as well have just worked in my business every single day, 80, you know, 80 hours a week. Exactly. It's, it's, it's about knowing what to know, right? Knowing what to do, totally. knowing, knowing how to spend your time. That's so important. Totally. Well, how do, how do people get in touch with your courses? And, and obviously you have the Superhuman Academy podcast, but how do people find your courses? How do they yep. sign up? And what kind of courses do you have offering right yeah, now? So pretty much everything I do is at superhumanacademy.com. We've got courses, podcasts, people can check out uh, the book, which there's a link in the header, uh, superhumanacademy.com slash book as well. Uh, I do want to let your audience know we have a 50% discount on everything we sell for active duty military personnel. But if you're recently out, uh, just send us an email anyway and, and my customer service people will take care of you. Uh, we're really big about supporting uh, not just in the U.S. service people, but everywhere. So it doesn't matter if you're listening from another country. Uh, drop us an email, um, and that is fifty five zero, not fifteen. Uh, and yeah, and people can check me out there. They can check me out on Instagram, uh, entrepreneur spelled N E W E R. Nice. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna jump on that, and we'll we'll get all that stuff on the show notes because this stuff is so valuable, guys. Awesome. I, whether you, whether you're just whether you're out or if you're in the military, if you're trying to advance your career, and you're trying to to some of you guys I know want to do special forces in docs, some of you want to join MARSOC. I mean, you're going to have to learn, right? And and that's a yep. huge factor in in trying to to advance yourself in the military or any other organization. So this stuff can definitely help big time. Um, any any last notes, Jonathan? Anything any gems, uh, tips or anything like that you want to share with the audience before we jump off? Yes. People often ask me like, okay, what do you do with all these learning techniques? Like, you know, have you learned 50 languages? Have you read all the books in the library? And, and you can do all those things. And I sometimes like to dabble in those things, but ultimately the real reason to do this is the human Right? It's to be able to remember people's names and, and listen to someone's story. And next time you talk to them, remember to follow up. It's to remember the, the kids' names of everyone you know, in, your, in your local circle or in your tribe or whatever. Uh, it's really about the human element. That's, that's the origin of memory is remembering the relationships of those that matter to us. And, and that's what I advocate people use this for more than anything else. That's huge. I mean, because, you know, if, if you're able to remember something about somebody else, if you little things, the, the name, the, the kids, the kids going through something right now, that, that helps so much to, to foster a relationship. And that's really what business is. It's relationships, yep. right? You're, you're trying and the to world would just be a much better place if we all remembered the name of the waiter that always waits on us at our favorite cafe, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Well, awesome, man. Well, Jonathan, I want to thank you. Uh, we're, as we're recording it, it is December 30th. And uh, I want to wish you a happy new year. Um, to I everybody. Absolutely, man. And, and to everybody out there, um, like I said, Jonathan's got a great show, the Superhuman Academy podcast. There are so many brilliant people who go on to that show. Um, really awesome people. I got to go on that show. I'm not as brilliant as most of the guests, but if you, were, you guys are interested in that, you can check me out on there. 
um, and uh, be looking forward to, to putting this out there. And on the show notes, we'll have everything you guys need to know to access the Superhuman Academy to get get your hands on those courses. Because like I said, I think this stuff is so important for all of us. Jonathan, awesome. thank you so thank much, you. man. Thanks for having me. And everyone listening, please leave Chris a review. We podcasters live on the reviews. So go on iTunes right now. Leave her a warrior soul. Awesome. Yes. Do exactly what he said. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, ladies and gents. Thank you so much. We'll be back at you later on this week with some more awesome content.